ज्ञानम परमम ध्येयम नॉलेज इज सुप्रीम so now let us try to think what uh, let us try to get into a little more detail not too much of detail of raman spectroscopy okay what have we learned so far what have we learned so far about spectroscopy in general why do transitions take place according to the discussion we have had according to uh, well of uh, time dependent perturbation theory what is the mechanism of interaction of molecule with radiation it is an interaction between a dipole and an electric field right and then remember when we had done that discussion we had uh, concluded that in order to get a vibrational transition the dipole moment must change as a consequence of the vibration in order to have a rotational transition the permanent dipole must be there okay in order to see it and we had ended that discussion with a question is it then impossible to get an idea about rotational level and vibrational levels of say dihydrogen h2 can we not get an idea about their bond length and bond strength that come from a discussion of rotational spectroscopy and vibrational spectroscopy and then we had said if you remember that you can do it using raman spectroscopy okay so now in these molecules in homonuclear diatomics dipole is not there right but it is possible to have even in these systems induced dipole right i believe you have studied things like london dispersion forces and all that you know that you can have dipole dipole interaction you can also have transitory induced dipole induced by the field and that can also interact so now that hydrogen say dihydrogen uh, uh, other homonuclear diatomics do not have a permanent dipole it is possible for us to have an interaction of their induced dipole with the field okay that is the mechanism that is uh, useful in raman spectroscopy so raman spectroscopy is all about interaction of induced dipoles with the electric field of light okay an induced dipole as you know if i write it as mu i mu for dipole i for induced that would be equal to the electric field multiplied by some constant alpha what is this alpha called yes polarizability alpha is polarizability you are right but actually this is not all you can have higher terms in e as well so you can write something like there are different ways to write it i'll just write beta into e square plus gamma into e to the power cube and so on and so forth where beta gamma these are coefficients for higher powers of e now when you go from alpha to beta there is a huge decrease in value beta is usually much much smaller than alpha if it is non zero even if it is non zero gamma is usually much much less than beta and so on and so forth so these are called okay what is beta and gamma what are they called in general yes i heard an answer so what is that answer higher higher coefficients actually that's right but then the thing is uh, if you give a name you have to give it a uh, name that sounds eh huh? virial coefficient okay virial coefficient yeah but then virial coefficients are generic there is a specific name to it oh i thought you said higher and i was kind of building my story on that <laughs> so it's like this alpha is what polarizability right this beta gamma these are called Uh, the hyperpolarizabilities of second order third order and so on and so forth i think some of you know it right and they are also denoted as something like the sky 2 and so on and so forth okay so if you have to consider these you understand that since these numbers are small 
or the, well, I should not say numbers, this, since this quantities are small, this E has to have a very large value for the higher order terms to be important, okay. That takes us to the regime of what is called nonlinear spectroscopy. Nonlinear spectroscopy, we will not discuss that in this course, but for our purpose, what we can do is we can restrict ourselves to what you know already mu i is equal to alpha e. But alpha is not a straightforward number. It is important that we understand this. It is going to come handy in a few weeks time. So, what you can do is, what is the meaning of this alpha polarizability? That means, how easily you can distort your electron cloud, let us say, right. Now, electron cloud is not a one dimensional thing, right or a one, electron cloud is not a point. It is somewhat like a three dimensional object. So, let us think of it in simple terms as say a balloon. Will you agree with me that a balloon could be a uh, reasonable model for an electron cloud, the air that is there inside, okay. Now, what is the meaning of this? I, I apply a field. So, if I take a balloon, what I do is I hold this balloon in my hand and press from two sides. That is applying a field. What happens? The balloon gets distorted. Agreed? Now, my question is this. When you press the balloon this way, does it get distorted only in this direction? It does get distorted in the other directions as well, is not it? You compress, the balloon becomes smaller along the axis along which you uh, put the pressure, but even along perpendicular axis, the balloon tries to expand. Exactly the same thing happens if I put it in a very, very qualitative fashion. Exactly the same thing happens when you apply an electric field to an electron cloud, okay. So, it is not very difficult to uh, understand that this mu i being a vector, I can write it as say mu i x mu i y mu i z, x, y and z denote the three directions. Of course, uh, that should bring us to the question of lab fixed coordinate and mo uh, molecule fixed coordinate. So, what I am trying to say is this, this will not be a function of just E x. It will be a linear combination of terms in E x, E y, E z, okay. So, I can write like this, E x, E y, E z. Since I am writing alpha, first term I will write alpha x x, first x for this second x for this, first x for the direction of the uh, component of the induced dipole moment, second x for the direction of the field, component of the field plus I will write alpha x y into E y, x because I am talking about mu i x, y because the field, direction of field I am considering is along y. The third constant will of course be alpha x z, okay. So far so good. If I have a balloon and I press it, so let us say this is z direction, this is z. So now I have applied the field in one particular direction, but then I have distortion not only along this direction, but also along x and y, right. So if I just have to write this equation, what will it be? Then actually it will not be this kind of an equation, it will be the other way around, right. You will write total mu induced will be vector sum of mu i x plus mu i y plus mu i z. Mu i x will be alpha x x into E x, okay. What about the z distortion? You have, sorry, I am saying, I am applying the field in z direction. So, that will be mu i x is alpha x z into E z. Then y distortion, what will it be? alpha y z into e z. So, for the balloon, I will get something like this, mu i will be alpha x z plus alpha y z plus alpha z z multiplied by e z because I have applied the field in only one particular direction. Now, if I apply the field in any random direction, I can take x y z components of that understood. So, for that induced, so now I am writing the other, uh, writing it the other way. 
I am writing for mu i x, I will have contributions from e z, e x as well as e y. Is that clearer? So, what will this be? Alpha y x, e x plus alpha y y, e y plus alpha y z, e z. What about this? Alpha, well, this will be E x, E y, E z, of course. Here, distortion is along z, field is along x, so it will be alpha z x. Actually, alpha z x and alpha x z are one and the same. Plus alpha y z, no, z y, right? But then z y and y z are actually the same. We are not going to prove it, just believe me plus alpha z z. Of course, this can be written very conveniently in matrix form, is not it? What I will do is, I will write it like this. So, this equation that we have written is really, it should be written like this, what is called a matrix eigenvalue equation. Well, uh, let us, no, no, uh, let us just say uh, it should be written as a matrix equation, okay. So, what we see is that instead of alpha, we have to use this matrix. So, alpha is really what is called a tensor. What is a tensor? What is the tensor? Uh -huh. There is no reason to be tense about tensor. Tensor is just an array of numbers. You are okay with matrix, right? So, that is all we will need for our case. Now, what I do is I write a matrix like this, then I write a matrix in front, then I write another matrix in front. So, that gives me a tensor. Basically, it is an array of numbers, it is a useful mathematical tool. For our case, if it is enough if we think that alpha is a matrix or tensor of rank 2, okay. So, now you have to actually deal with all these components and you see that for, if I think of the components of the field, field is a vector, right? What are the three components of field? E x, E y, E z. Dipole moment is a vector. So, I have to deal with three components, mu i x, mu i y, mu i z, that is enough. However, when we talk about polarizability, one direction is not enough, okay. You have to talk about alpha x x, that means polarizability produced in x direction by a field in x direction. Alpha x x y is polarizability in x direction produced by a field in y direction. Alpha x z, well dipole moment induced in x direction by a field in z direction and so on and so forth. Of course, these are going to be largest x x x y x z. So, if you go back to the balloon example, distortion will be most in the direction in which you apply pressure, right. So, in fact, you what you could do is you can do a transformation of coordinates and diagonalize this matrix, which is a very, very common tool in quantum mechanics, right, but we will not try to do all that. What we need to understand is that when you want to talk about components of polarizability, one direction is not enough. It is always two directions that are required, product of two axes. This is going to come handy for us later on when we try to determine the selection rules for Raman transitions for polyatomic vibrations and stuff like that. Yes. For a polarizability, we need two reference states, yes. So, that is why if you want to perform a complete discussion of Raman spectroscopy from quantum mechanics, you need to invoke what are called direction cosines. Direction cosines are essentially cosines of angles between the axes in a space fixed coordinate and a molecule fixed coordinate, okay. In fact, if we discuss direction cosines, you will understand, it is not difficult at all. What is problematic is the next part. 
when you use direction cosines as operators, then we have to uh, learn a, a few things more before we can use it uh, to actually do the quantum mechanics. That is why you are not getting into that. But it is right that there are two frames of reference. In any problem like this, there are always two frames of reference. One is space fixed, the other is molecule fixed. Let us uh, proceed. Remember this, this is going to come handy later on. In order to develop a simplistic idea pertaining to Raman effect, what we can think is this. We know how to write E, do not we? How did we write E earlier? 2 E 0 sin 2 pi nu T. What is this nu? Nu is the frequency of light, okay. What we can do is we can write alpha as say alpha 0 plus A sin 2 pi nu m t. What is the meaning of 2 pi nu m t? Let us say there is a molecular motion that causes a change in polarizability. Let us think of dihydrogen. Well, there are two things that we need to understand here. Let us discuss this first, then we will come to the other one. So, we have dihydrogen at equilibrium, when it is at equilibrium bond length, there is some kind of polarizability, right. What happens when I stretch the molecule? Does the polarizability remain same or does the polarizability change? Without getting into the a discussion about whether it increases or decreases, whether it increases or decreases might be a little more difficult to understand. But I hope it is not difficult to understand that if I change the bond length, if I increase it or if I decrease it, then my, uh, the well, not my, uh, polarizability of a dihydrogen molecule is going to change. You agree with that? Now think of what vibration is. It is a periodic motion, right. So, what vibration would do is that it would change the polarizability periodically, okay. So, for something like that, am I allowed to write polarizability like this? Alpha 0 is the polarizability at equilibrium bond distance and the modulation is brought in by the sine 2 pi nu m term. So, what would this nu m be? Nu m in this case would be the vibrational frequency of the molecule right okay let us think about rotation does polarizability change when a dihydrogen molecule doesn't vibrate but rotate to do that uh, we need to invoke the concept of what is called polarizability ellipsoid anyone who has studied banwell's book would I mean anyone who has studied Raman spectroscopy from Banwell's book would be familiar with this term polarizability ellipsoid. Polarizability ellipsoid is defined as the plot of 1 by root over alpha i. Actually why 1 by root over alpha i all of a sudden? That is because it comes from something called, uh, so when you discuss the angular momentum that is where this ellipsoid was first used. This is an extrapolation of that. So, uh, let us just take it axiomatically, okay, 1 by root over alpha i. Now, think of hydrogen molecule. Polarizability of ellipsoid, if you look at from this direction is something like this. What am I trying to say here? I am trying to say that it is easier to distort the electron cloud this way than this way. Of course, the length is inversely proportional to square root, do not forget. So, wherever this ellipsoid is longish, there the polarizability is actually small. Where the, wherever the ellipsoid is narrower, there the polarizability is actually more. Do you agree with me when I say that it is easier to distort the bond this way than this way? Because when you actually distort this way, then you are working with the nucleus. 
when you try to distort this way then you have to overcome the attraction of the electron that it has with both the nuclei. So, it is easier to polarize the electron cloud along the bond than perpendicular, but then if you look from this direction then what do you see what kind of ellipsoid do you see is the perspective clear this is hydrogen molecule first is this and now I am saying you look at it in from this direction what kind of uh, shape will you see what will the cross section be this direction and this direction let us say no difference same. So, this cross section is actually circular. So, now what you do is you mentally superpose these two what is the shape that you get you get the shape of a well behaved egg right eggs are not really symmetric right there is a small curvature on one side and a larger curvature on one side if you have an egg that is perfect ok completely symmetric then that is the shape that you would get. In books I think it says the shape is of tangerine I do not know how many of you know what a tangerine is I do not know if I have ever seen a tangerine in my life. So, I egg is easier to understand everybody has seen an egg right, but an idealized egg that is completely symmetric on both sides ok. So, that is what the polarizability ellipsoid looks like. Now, think of it even forget this think that the molecule is rotating let us say I apply the field in this way and the molecule rotates what will happen in this position what is the kind of polarizability uh, that will be seen by the field this. Then when the molecule has gone like this then the field will interact with a polarizability that is like this ok. So, do you agree with me that when dihydrogen molecule rotates then it presents different polarizabilities at different times to the field and since rotation is a periodic motion this change in uh, polarizability is also periodic. So, for rotation also it is ok if I write my polarizability in this fashion alpha 0 plus a into sin 2 pi nu m t nu m is the frequency of the molecular motion vibration or rotation. You can read this part from Banwell's book. You can read it from uh, Grebel's book as well, but Banwell's book is good enough. So, it is ok. Can I proceed with this? All right. So, now if I expand this, I get mu i is equal to alpha 0 plus a sin 2 pi nu m t multiplied by 2 e 0 sin 2 pi nu let me write it nu l t just to emphasize that it is the frequency of light. So, this gives me 2 alpha 0 e 0 sin 2 pi nu l t plus 2 alpha 0 no where did alpha 0 come from again 2 a e 0 sin 2 pi nu m t sin 2 pi nu l this is what you get 2 alpha 0 e 0 sin 2 pi nu l t plus this there is a 2 and there is a half. So, that will cancel a e 0 sin no not sin sorry cos tush. 2 pi nu m minus nu l into t then plus or minus minus a e 0 cos 2 pi nu m plus nu l into t is that right ok. Now, as you know 
uh, how do we decide which transitions will take place and which transition will not transition moment integral right. What do we use in the transition moment integral? We use wave functions and we use uh, this dipole moment. Here instead of dipole moment we want to use the induced dipole moment. So, from here since I have three terms in induced dipole moment I will get three terms in the transition moment integral as well. The first term is corresponding to a frequency of light that is unchanged ok. That is what gives us Rayleigh scattering. The second term corresponds of course, this is we have to use this in pre dipole pre uh, transition moment integral right. We have to use this in uh, the perturbation theoretical treatment itself because T is still there. So, this one gives me what? What kind of frequency will it be? Nu m hey, sorry I was thinking usually this is what you write nu l minus nu m nu l plus nu m no harm if you write the other way round, but this is conventional. So, this is what? What is this frequency? It is a different frequency than nu l right and what is the difference? The difference is the frequency of molecular motion. What is this? Nu l plus nu m. So, once again a different frequency and the difference of frequency is equal to the frequency of molecular motion. So, these two terms would give you the terms for Raman effect all right. And as you see Raman effect can be two of two kinds one in which frequency is decreased frequency of the uh, scattered light is less than frequency of the incident light another one in which frequency of scattered light is more than frequency of incident light. So, if you think classically what does this mean? It means that in the first case what did we say frequency is frequency of scattered light is less than the frequency of incident light that means the uh, photon has given, given up some energy to the molecule right right and in the second case it is uh, more nu l plus nu m. So, in that case the uh, photon has taken up some energy from the molecule you can think this way this that is a classical way of thinking. The quantum way of thinking is something that we can denote using a diagram something like this. Suppose these are the energy levels of a molecule can be rotational can be vibrational. What you do is typically you use a frequency that is uh, much more than the kind of frequency you are trying to study. So, if you want to study uh, vibrational levels you use visible light. If you want to study rotational levels then you use IR light. So, what this light does is suppose you are here initially it takes the system out of the manifold to what is called a virtual level. Now, that brings us to the unresolvable at this level question of what a virtual level is. What is a virtual level? Uh, I do not have a good answer without going into the detailed uh, time dependent perturbation theoretical treatment of the problem. All I have is a couple of analogies to try and give you the impression that you have understood what vi virtual level is, but analogies always have to be taken with a pinch of salt. There are they are very crude ways of understanding things. So, before saying what a virtual level is what is a real level or what we generally call are stationary states. What is the definition of a stationary states? A stationary state is one in which psi psi star is independent of time right and they are always associated with uh, specific values of energy right. So, they are good eigenfunctions of Hamiltonian. Virtual states are not good eigenfunctions of Hamiltonian. For them psi psi star is not time independent. So, if you can promote the molecule to a virtual state then what happens is lifetime of this virtual state is very small it has to come down immediately ok. What are the analogies? Analogy is this 
sorry I cannot even recall one of them. The other one is this what are you doing here? You have some kind of an electron distribution right. When there is a resonant excitation what you do essentially is that light comes in and then takes the state to another kind of electron distribution right. You need to uh, watch my hands. Let us say this is the electron distribution in ground state. This is the electron distribution in the excited state stationary state ok. So, what we are saying essentially from Raman uh, effect is that when light comes and falls on it your electron cloud has not studied quantum mechanics right. So, it does not really know that it is not supposed to get distorted from here to here. So, what happens is the distortion starts ok, but then after a while uh, you run out of gas run out of petrol. Energy is not enough energy in of the incident light is not enough to take the electron cloud from this shape to this shape which is stationary. So, it takes it to whatever state it does with that energy and then since the light is gone it just comes back that is analogy number 1. I remember the analogy number 2 that is perhaps even more crude that analogy is got to do has got to do with basketball. Think of a basketball, you hold it in your hand, that is ground state, ok. If you do not tire, and of course, we are all dealing with ideal systems. So, we will say that we are also an ideal system, our hands do not tire. If you do not tire, then you can hold the ball for an eternity, ok. Lifetime of the ground state is infinity. Then you throw it towards the uh, basketball ring. If you throw it with the right direction and right energy, then what will happen? The ball enters the basket and then it stays there for a few seconds it falls right. So, that uh, basket is analogous to an excited uh, state of the molecule. It has a finite lifetime. Are we clear? Of course, if you uh, tie the ends of that basket then uh, lifetime can be infinity, but fortunately it is not. Now, think what happens if you throw the ball towards the basket, but with insufficient energy. Let us say same right direction is right, insufficient energy. What happens? The ball rises to some height and then falls ok. Whatever height it reaches is analogous to the virtual state of the molecule. How, what is the height that will be achieved by the ball? That depends on how hard you throw it. If I throw it like this, it will go up to this. If I throw it a little harder, it will go up to this. Okay. So, virtual state can be anywhere between the two uh, stationary states. Anything between these two can be virtual state. Quantum mechanically you write the wave function of that as a linear sum of all possible wave functions. That of course, is not a uh, an Eigen function anymore. Now, now we come to Rayleigh and Raman. You have thrown the basketball, it reaches whatever height it reaches, it has not reached the basket comes down and you catch it again ok. Suppose you threw it from this side and catch it at this side as well. What is the total energy transfer 0 right. However, you can hold it here when it falls you can catch it a little higher or you can catch it a little lower right. Coming back to the molecule what that would mean is that your basketball has reached this side it comes down and let us say you catch it here that means, it has come down to a level that is higher than the level of origin or it can come down lower ok. Think of the energies of the photons that will be emitted in these two cases. In this case the energy is smaller than the energy that you had provided initially. So, frequency is going to be nu uh, how do I write it nu l minus nu m. In this case, frequency will be nu l plus nu m ok. This is called a Stokes shifted M Raman scattering, this is called anti Stokes shifted Raman scattering. So, we will stop here today. Next day, we will perhaps invest 10 15 minutes to complete this discussion and then go on to uh, the next topic. 